So hello, good afternoon. My name is Aya Santa Chita. I'm a Buddhist nun and I, I'm originally from Austria. I have an accent like Arnold Schwarzenegger. And because he's born very close to where I come from, it's about 45 kilometers south from where I come from. That's uh, what we have in common, Arnie and I. And also we both very concerned about the environment. We have, that we have in common too. And um, yeah, I'm a Buddhist nun almost 30 years now. And, and I live here in a small monastery in the Sierra foothills about an hour, good hour from Sacramento. And we are at the moment five bhikkhunis and one uh, postulant and three lay women living here full time. And we've just been in a 10 day retreat, which ended yesterday evening. So I'm still having that kind of uh, good uh, vibe from the retreat. And I hope I can share some of that with you because it's so much more pleasant to teach, you know, from a mind which is pretty calm and not too burdened with too many duties at the moment. And I certainly feel very relieved about, you know, the result of the elections that was really scary. And even, you know, there's still a lot to be sorted out, but I think the worst is, is over. And I've, I was very, you know, during the retreat we found out. So we were all like, ah, we were all really happy. <laughs> so, um, yeah. You know, usually um, we are doing this series on the Noble Eightfold Path, you know, not very glamorous indeed, just like a very ordinary Noble Eightfold Path, which is actually not like a wide, you know, wide, well uh, visible path. Often it's, you know, it feels like we are just kind of, it's all touch and go and we are just kind of, you know, one, inch at a time we we find our way because it's often not very much like a path but it's more like a, you know following our sense of what is appropriate as a next step because sometimes we can't see even further than after the next step and uh, you know, we usually start with the refugees and the precepts, and then afterwards we chant the Noble Eightfold Path mantra. So, if I don't know if you know if there are anybody here who doesn't know what the five precepts are and would like to know. Okay, so you know, we uh, Kathy is gonna screen share them in now, and whoever is interested, you know, can can come along with me and. Um, Kathy, let's, uh, un I'm going to unmute Carl. Carl, may I unmute you so I have one person responding to me? Great. Uh, I think you have to unmute yourself, actually. So we there would we start, thank you. So we yeah. would start like I, I chant the Namo Tassa three times and then whoever of you wants to join in, then you chant it. And then we do the refugees as a call and response. And then who of you wants to take the precepts? We take the precepts after that. And, you know, if you can't take all five, you can take four. That's okay. It's better than taking five and then already knowing that you will not keep it. So whatever you can do, take as many as you can, I suggest. <clears throat> Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma samputasa. Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma samputasa. Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma samputasa. Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa. Namo tassa 
Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Samma Sambuddhasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Samma Sambuddhasa Bhutang Saranang Gachami Bhutang Saranang Gachami Tamang saranang gachami. Tamang saranang gachami. Sangkang saranang gachami. Sangkang saranang gachami. Dutiampi putang saranang gachami. Dutiampi putang saranang gachami. Dutiampi tamang saranang gachami. Dutiampi tamang saranang gachami. Dutiampi sangkang saranang gachami. Dutiampi sangkang saranang gachami. Dutiampi putang saranang gachami. Tatiampi budang saranang gachami. Tatiampi tamang saranang gachami. Tatiampi tamang saranang gachami. Tatiampi sangkang saranang gachami. Tatiampi sangkang saranang gachami. So now we go further to the precepts. I say it and then after, please repeat it after me. I undertake the precept to refrain from taking the life of any living creature. I undertake the precept to refrain from taking the life of any living creature. I undertake the precept to refrain from taking that which is not given. I undertake the precept to refrain from taking that which is not given. I undertake the precept to refrain from sexual misconduct. I undertake the precept to refrain from sexual misconduct. I undertake the precept to refrain from false and harmful speech. I undertake the precept to refrain from false and harmful speech. I undertake the precept to refrain from consuming intoxicating drink and drugs which lead to carelessness. I undertake the precept to refrain from consuming intoxicating drink and drugs, which lead to carelessness. So now I'm just going to end with the traditional blessing. Imani pancha sikapadani samadhyami silena sukadinyanti silena boga sampada silena niputinyanti tasma silang visotaye sadhu 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 sadhu. So great. It's a very precious, you know, to take the for people taking the five precepts in this very intense times. It's a great uh, gift to the world, you know, giving the gift of fearlessness to others and also giving it to yourself, you know. Yeah, it's a very powerful statement to make, you know, at a time when the president even doesn't keep any of the precepts live alone other people. So let's go to the Noble Eightfold Path Mantra now. And Kathy is going to screen share that in. So we, we're just going to go three rounds with that, with the, just, you know, chanting the words, the eight limbs of the Noble Eightfold Path. Samadhi. Di sama sangka po sama waca sama kamanto sama acibo sama wayamo sama sate sama samadi 
Samma titti, samma sankapo, samma vacha, samma kamanto, samma achivo, samma vayamo, samma sati, samma samadhi, samma titti. Di sama sankapo, sama vacha, sama kamanto, sama achivo, sama vayamo, sama sati, sama samadhi. So we usually do that mantra just to set the tone a little bit to gather the energy in and then we do a, a meditation and I give a little bit of guidance and then after that I try to you know, give a little dhamma reflection and then there will be a little bit of time also for clarifying comments or maybe discussing some points which I've brought up and I often start you know with uh, one of the poems from the early Buddhist nuns the enlightened Buddhist nuns, you know, have been contemporaries of the Buddha. And uh, there's a book, you know, of, of contemporary uh, renderings of those very old utterances. And uh, I'm gonna start with uh, Bhadra Bhikkhuni and her name is here translated as Lucky. And she says, you always considered yourself lucky because things seemed to work out the way you wanted. Now luck has a different meaning. Lucky to be walking a path that finds peace in the arising and passing away of each present moment, regardless of how things work out or don't. You always considered yourself lucky because things seem to work out the way you wanted. Now luck has a different meaning. Lucky to be walking a path that finds peace in the arising and passing away of each present moment, regardless of how things work out or don't. So I think that's a, you know, very good uh, way of expressing really what the path is when it's not anymore so much about, you know, that I get what I want, but it, it's much more about, you know, doing the right thing in terms of cultivating the path. Because whatever we get, you know, if we want it or don't want it, it's going to change again. But the way how we are cultivating our minds, that is going to stay with us, you know, even from one life to the next. So it's a, it's a, the ultimate good investment, really, if I may say it very bluntly. And I think it is like a, a very well hidden secret in plain sight, because I think there's lots of people who do not understand that, how true that really is, you know. And it's, it's just long-term investment, really long-term, but it's going to, you know, it's not easily destroyed. If we really have had some insight, it's gonna translate into letting go. And that's what the path, what the path is all about, you know, in letting go of our preconceived ideas of the way things are and making space for, life to speak for itself. And that sounds kind of easier, you know, to say than to do it, I agree. But this also where we have, for example, the precepts and where we have Sangha and where we have so many, you know, skillful meditation instructions in order to help us to you know, make it a reality for us. So please, you know, find a posture you can sustain for about uh, 
45 minutes. And just, you know, become aware of the body, simply the body sitting there. Whole body awareness, body sitting and breathing in and breathing out. And then before we continue, you know, just bringing to mind for a moment, you know, why do you meditate? Why are you here today? Why do you practice? And then allowing the mind to rest on the body, just as the body rests on the cushion. Just very simple. And knowing that you are breathing in when you are breathing in. And knowing that you are breathing out when you are breathing out. When you're noticing, you know, that the mind wanders off, thinking about their hopes and fears, past and future, just gently bringing it back to whole body awareness, just with a smile, you know, just dropping it. Because that's what we are really, you know, training here. It's the capacity for letting go. Just becoming aware of you know, how the heart is feeling right now, the mind. 
what you're bringing to this uh, meeting today. I'd just like to do a bit of a guidance for like Brahma Vihara meditation, metta, starting with metta, loving kindness, into bringing up in the heart an image of, of a little creature or a baby, puppy, kitten, or some lovely creature, and it brings a sense of uh, loving kindness up in your heart. that sweetness of wishing, you know, may this being and may all beings be happy. So allowing that uh, quality of meta being ignited in the heart and then, you know, with the in-breath, Familiarizing yourself how that feels and with the out breath relaxing to space, allowing that uh, quality to go out into space a little bit without any forcing. May all beings be happy. including myself. And without any forcing, slowly just allowing that uh, quality of meta to radiate out a little in front to one side behind to the left the front above and below so may all beings be happy It was being aware of the spaciousness of a mind filled with matter, permeated with matter, saturated with matter. The first of the four Brahma Viharas.
you know, one of the most you know, noble emotions we as human beings can experience. Cradling, you know, like cradling the fearful mind in the cradle of metta. And then it just relaxes and opens up without any forcing. And then we can change over to karuna, compassion, by bringing up an image of uh, somebody in a, in a situation which is more difficult than our own situation right now. So it arouses that sense of compassion, maybe a, you know, image of a sick person or somebody who has lost something dear and then you know paying attention to how that uh, quality in the heart changes naturally it's a different noble emotion of compassion May all beings be free from harm and the intention to harm. May all beings be free from harm and the intention to harm. Again, you know, breathing out that quality of metta ever so gently and allowing it to radiate out. And first letting it uh, radiate out in front of us. No forcing. And then to one side. To the back. the other side, front, above and below, Karuna.
Then we bring an image to mind of somebody who has a, enjoys good fortune. Maybe a little child we know, you know, who wins like a competition or wins a prize and is very happy or somebody who is successful in something in their lives. Just having that wish, may all beings enjoy good fortune. Allowing that to well up in the heart. Allow that to radiate out in front of us. To one side. Back. To the other side. front of us and above and below sitting in a sphere of mudita sympathetic joy male beings enjoy good fortune and contentment And then we come to upeka, equanimity, which is, you know, we can compare it with the love of a grandmother for her child, for her grandchild, you know, which she has seen everything under the sun. So she, you know, she can just uh, be there and allow the child to make mistakes. You know, may every 
one take responsibility for their own happiness. And learn from their quote unquote mistakes. And that equanimity is informed by all the other three Brahma Viharas, Metta, Karuna, and Mudita. It's not an indifference, it's a wise sense of care. And then allowing that to radiate out in front of us. To one side. The back. The other side. Above and below, Ubeka. It has a coolness to it, like the full moon. My generosity. If you notice, you know, that your mind wanders off thinking about something, just gently bringing it back. And if needed, you're not know, just starting again with the image of one of the Brahma Viharas and bring forth that uh, radiation again. Otherwise, just you know, becoming aware of the spaciousness of the mind, which is imbued with this noble emotion. You know, just letting go of thinking and then uh, introducing this uh, Brahma Vihara to the mind is just like the laws of nature taking their course, you know, then the mind just naturally opens up like a flower. Like if you give the right causes and conditions, the flower blossoms and with the mind it's just the same. And encourage the right thinking and then the mind opens up in this manner. So then dropping the Brahma Vihara and just being with the boundlessness, the boundless space. It's almost like listening, listening to the boundlessness which doesn't end at the walls of this room.
they're all you know all thoughts all solidity everything is left behind just spaciousness infinite space that's our object right now very subtle there's no no solidity to that The whole universe is in the mind. And then, uh, you know, dropping that perception of boundless space and being just aware of that which knows the space which is also immeasurable just making like making a u-turn you know looking at that which knows being aware of awareness we can say and an empty knowing So dropping the object and the subject itself is becomes the object we can say or the subject knowing itself. Turning inward. And not thinking about it, but just, you know, when you hear those words, the mind will go with it. And just being aware of that. So, you know, before it was empty of solidity, just being aware of space, and now it's empty of object. Being aware of awareness. Boundless consciousness, boundless awareness. It is more subtle than boundless space. And then as a next step, just dropping the ego, dropping this sense of I behind that knowing. That knowing it's not a, a thing, knowing is a, is a process. But it can be you know, a last vestige of identification. I, I am that which knows. Dropping that I, it's just knowing, a verb, not a noun. And being that knowing. Yeah, and whenever the mind you know wants to grasp onto something and make make a story out of it, form a thought, just dropping it. Not allowing the mind to establish itself, to just let that be that flow. Not you know allowing it to freeze over. Just flowing, flowing. You know, that's what we are 
training here, that capacity to just stay in the flow without stopping anywhere. And as soon as there's a stopping, there's an ego which wants something and doesn't want something. We don't allow that to interrupt the flow. We are aware of it, but we don't get stuck there. And that, that you know, that... Uh, that neediness to cling on is going to be washed away in that manner, washed out slowly. Like stones in a river over time, you know, they become very smooth and round and they become smaller and smaller and then it's going to be sand and then it's going to be gone. But that's, you know, what we are doing with the practice is gets broken down more and more and washed away until there's nothing left of it. Just body and breathing without identification. Peaceful. And the whole universe fits into that. simply because it is, not because I like it or I don't like it, just because it is. And when the mind is enriched in this way, it's easy to let go. It's just if the mind is stressed out or discontented, then it wants to hold on. I'm just noticing that. doesn't take much you know to create that sense of contentment in the mind doesn't need to go and shop anything for that it's a very simple exercise we've just been doing And then it comes to an end.
and you know for the remainder of the meditation just becoming aware of impermanence that even you know a very sublime state of mind it's impermanent and when it's time to put it down we put it down we can come back to it at another time And then just uh, remembering it's that, you know, paying attention to impermanence with an open mind. That's what is considered the most powerful uh, practice in the early teachings. There's a, a sutta in the Anguttara and Ekaya. It speaks of, you know, paying attention to impermanence, even for the time, what it takes to make a finger snap like that. It's considered more meritorious than, you know, giving meal dana to the Buddha. It's incredible. Because it washes away the craving it washes away the clinging if we really see impermanence clearly this is also very good at the end of any meditation you know to just reflect a little at least on impermanence you know however the meditation was good good in the sense of pleasant and bad in the sense of unpleasant It is impermanent and to just reflect on that a little bit at the end. Consciously and you know, bringing that to mind. And it washes away the grasping. Because the mind sees you know, for itself that it's futile to hold on to that which is impermanent. We can't control that. But what we can do is we can train the mind accordingly. This is in our power. And this is what we are doing right now. And that's, you know, what the teaching is all about. It's not about trying to change the world, but it's about changing the mind. So it's more in sync with the way things are. And that's results in less stress. And once you know that adjustment has been fully accomplished, that's what we call awakening or nibbana, full awakening.
and it starts with uh, being aware of impermanence, even for a finger snap. And I'm sure, you know, you have had several finger snaps of that today at this guided meditation. So give a sense of uh, confidence, you know, we are on the right path. It's not rocket science, really. It's rather like what a humble path. So now if you would like to stretch your legs for a moment and then you're going to be back here again in three, four, five minutes. Okay. Um, is it on? You know, going down the uh, mantra, we are at uh, summer sati today, or what's called, you know, right mindfulness or connected mindfulness or wise mindfulness, you know, mindfulness which is uh, integrated in the Noble Eightfold Path, like all of the qualities, you know, always in uh, connection with the others. And I wanted to share another poem with you. Um, yes. And her name is, is Dira Bikuni, and Dira means self-reliant. And she says, look closely, my heart. See how all things arise and pass away. Even that which is turning on this, oh, even that which is turning the shapes on this page into the sounds and thoughts. <clears throat> you are right now silently speaking to yourself. When you no longer need to read the signs to find your way, you'll know for yourself that books and maps can only get you so far. There is a direct path. So it speaks about, you know, see how all things arise and pass away. What I just mentioned before, you know, it's considered the most <coughs> central feature of what needs to be seen in order to result in liberation of ignorance. And, and, you know, in books and maps, they can only get us and teachers as well, you know, they can only get us that far. But then there's a direct path, which is inside, you know, by really applying what we hear. And, uh, you know, having the patience and the endurance to go through that process of varying out those layers and layers of conditioning. And, you know, the Noble Eightfold Path is like a, a template which helps us to stay on course. And even, you know, sometimes it's, it's far from being like a smooth kind of a journey, but it, at least, you know, we know what is the next step. And we also understand, for example, you know, that the five precepts are that which can keep us, you know, keep us moving, really, because they are considered um, a foundation for the path, which we cannot uh, ignore, really. Or we can ignore it, and then we have to pay the price for that, which is 
also okay, you know, sometimes. But at least we know, you know, what the deal is. So what is that direct path? And uh, I think, you know, in, in uh, more daily language, I'd say that that direct path is all about not shutting down. It's all about not shutting down. And it's, it's about uh, connecting, you know, with that uh, inner drive to evolve, which all living systems have that, you know. And if that, you know, if we have lost connection to that drive, I think we tend to become depressed, really. If we have, you know, developed lifestyles which cut us off from that innate sense of fulfillment, you know, of our greatest potential. And, and then it gets often kind of hijacked in fulfillment of doing more shopping or doing more traveling or doing more, you know, bodybuilding or being more beautiful and all of those things, you know, which can give like a kick of fulfillment, which is very, very fragile. But the kind of fulfillment, you know, which we are really looking for is, is this expansion of the heart and the expansion of the mind, which comes from putting down a lot of stuff, you know, internal limitations, which we have been accumulating, you know, over lifetimes and which is just also part of the, uh, you know, unenlightened conditioning, which we all receive in our families, in our societies. And, and there's nothing bad about that. <clears throat> it's just what it is. And we can, you know, there's a way to deal with this. And, uh, you know, and the more we are capable of putting down this conditioning, the more we have that sense of fulfillment of feeling that we are part of something much bigger than ourselves. And, and I feel, you know, on a, on, a, on a level of the human species, you know, it, it, we are now going in that direction where if we do not, uh, you know, grow into that, into that direction where we understand ourselves as a global community, we will not uh, be around for much longer, you know, because we have difficult... Um, issues, you know, to deal with such, in particular, you know, uh, human-induced global warming, you know, which we need to deal with as, as a global community. But if we don't have the emotional uh, know-how, you know, how to do that, then it will be very impossible, you know, to get anywhere because there will be always this sense of uh, defending ourselves against the other. And, and that is a great uh, loss, you know, to us because we, we are losing energy in that, in that way. And we are not going in the right direction. We are going in the, we're going towards the past and there is no way back. You know, evolution is, is, is moving. If we go with it or not, those, you know, species who don't come along, they will perish. I mean, as simple as that. So, yeah. So in a way, you know, I feel that uh, what's called AGW, the anthropogenic global warming, you know, is, is somehow almost like a, you know, a, a cosmic skillful means to force us to go in a direction we might voluntarily not be willing, you know, to put down some of our preferences. And now we have that, there's this big need there, you know, we need to respond, we need to organize ourselves. And for that, we need to learn to relate to the world and to our own, you know, kind of more primitive emotions in different manner. 
by not kind of by by kind of st trying to stamp them out and to not have them because that's impossible. We are, you know, a mammal and we do have needs and so on and so forth. And we need to attend to that, but we can attend to it with a sense of uh, compassion and wisdom, you know, not trying to be something what we are not, but, you know, taking that what we are on the ride, you know, towards something much bigger. And I think that's in a way, you know, what the Buddha's teaching is offering us, you know, it's not, trying to deny needs, but it's, it's trying to find a clear distinction and discernment between needs and wants, you know, and I think that mindfulness and sati is really very, very instrumental in that uh, undertaking, you know, to find out what is really going on. Is this just like kind of an idea? Is this just a, in my mind? Or is, is there what's really happening right now? Because we have a tendency, you know, to add a lot to our experience, to add something on top of it, you know, in terms of me and mine. Do I like it or don't I like it? And all of those things. And it's, I think it's okay, you know, to, to know that, of course, but to then, uh, you know, allow our whole lives to be ruled by our likes and dislikes. That's not very growthful, you know, simply. It just keeps us stuck, keeps us stuck in the past, you know, in very early conditioning, which we, some things we don't even know why we like or don't like, because maybe, you know, there was somebody earlier in our lives who told us that. And it's, it's good to just look at those things with uh, more space around it, really. So, you know, in particular, because, you know, I, I told you before, I'm Austrian, so I'm from Europe. And, and uh, when I came over here to America 10 years ago, you know, in the, in the beginning, it looks like, oh, we, you know, we, we look the same and uh, so on and so forth. But I, I quickly found out, you know, that there is some, quite some differences, you know, in, in the conditioning and that, uh, the individualism, you know, which is very enshrined here in America is, is particularly strong here in a way I hadn't experienced it before. And it had some really good sides to it and it has some not so good sides to it, you know. And the good thing was that, you know, I and body and myself, we had been, uh, you know, stepping out of a, of a very... Um, traditional system of, of monastic training, you know, which was not giving the appropriate space for females. And, and that was, you know, it was very traditional and it was in England. And then we came over here to America and people said, just like, chuck it all out, you know, and we give the women the same as we give the men. And that was wonderful because nobody would ha have offered us that in, in England, you know, so we came here and it was wonderful. But then we also see, you know, that, uh, for example, in the individualism in, in our current president, you know, which is completely unchecked. There's no consideration for the most, you know, um, you know, speaking the truth or, you know, the, the most simple, guidelines of decent human behavior everything is allowed you know you just be yourself you know and so that is is a very lonely way of of being in the world and and very destructive really so this lonely cowboy syndrome you know here on the west coast and you can you ride into the distance you know there's always somewhere else you can go where where you can they control, you know, but as you all know, it's, that's all, no longer happening in this world, you know, where we have hit the limits already. And we are already starting to have the repercussions of, of that. So, 
So this, you know, this unblocking of uh, relating to everything what is there, you know, that's what the training is all about. You know, unblocking our hampered ways of relating to what is. Because you know that's really the also one of the hallmarks of the of the Buddhist teaching is is how you know how do I handle this experience right now? You know what what's happening in my body, what's happening in my mind, what's happening in the world around me, what's happening you know in relationship with others. It's how do I handle that in a way which is growthful and which is fulfilling, you know, fulfilling our potential. And, uh, you know, what to do with that, which is happening right now, what's the right way to respond? That's really what the, the teaching is helping us to discern. And, and mindfulness, sati, is, is the central quality, you know, which enables us to know what is happening right now. It's a feminine quality. So it's a, it's a noun, a feminine noun. And that gives this additional, you know, sense of um, receptivity in the sense of, you know, being receptive to what is happening right now, not only to the parts which I like, but as much as I can stay conscious to and then from that way of being conscious you know giving birth to new perspectives on to what to do with this you know so you know allowing the world to speak for itself rather than uh, projecting all of our ideas onto it and you know, and allowing the world to speak with itself by, with mindfulness, with uh, sati, you know, receiving what's happening right now. And then there's also a second quality, which is in the Pali language, is called sampachanya, which is a clear comprehension, you know, which brings in a sense of perspective. For example, you know, noticing in the present moment experience, being aware of impermanence. So like the noticing is the mindfulness, the sati, but then seeing it, seeing the changingness of it, that would be the sampachanya bringing that wisdom in action, that is. So that, that they need to always work together because, you know, mindfulness itself, if it's not integrated in the path and you know in sampachanya is is that which brings the the wisdom of the path to the present moment if if you just have mindfulness alone you know you could mindfully uh, you know kind of shoot at a deer out there you know that wouldn't be mindfulness in the sense of what the buddha speaks about so it needs to be always integrated in the path and the Sampachanya is brings that integration along, you know. And, um, you know, the clarity of purpose really for our lives. And uh, so, and, and the, you know, the uh, practice of, of mindfulness happens in what's called the four satipatthana, the four, you know, the four um, areas in which we are applying mindfulness. And I, you will have all heard about it, but I'm just going to go through them very shortly. The first one is mindful of being mindful of the body then mindful of feeling tones in the sense of pleasant unpleasant neutral then mindful of mind states or moods of the mind angry expansive lustful 
depressed, all of those things. And the fifth one is, is, is the principles according which the mind operates. Or, you know, the laws of nature, how they manifest in the mind. So, you know, when we sit down for the meditation, we can go through all four of them or just attending to one. And, you know, and it's very, very helpful, uh, you know, when we are having a challenging situation in our lives, you know, for example, you need to go to a meeting and, and you know, there is a person or two in there which usually trigger you emotionally, you know, so before you press down the door handle, you just, okay, mindful of the body, <laughs> and, and then you step in, and then you maybe already feel the contraction, you know, but at least your mind, you, you, at least you're knowing what's going on. And then you become aware, oh, there's an unpleasant, it feels unpleasant, there is a sense of no, I don't want it. You still go in, but you know, you know, you know what's there. You know what you bring. And then, you know, if we are aware of the, of the feeling, then we might also be aware how it, it changes the mood of the mind a little bit, you know. But if it's conscious, it changes the mood of the mind just maybe a tiny bit, you know. But if it's unconscious, then it has much more power over us. So then, you know, there might be that sense of a, like a sense of aversion, you know, coloring the mind. And then we know that too. And then we just, you know, keeping, keeping the mindfulness going so we don't blurt it out. And if we have succeeded, you know, in doing that for a few times, then there is a sense of empowerment there, you know. And next time when that happens, there is more space because I, I know I can do it, you know, I can do it. I can feel angry and not blurt it out. And then, you know, automatically next time, the level, I mean, maybe not exactly next time, but maybe 10 times later, you know, then the it, the, it won't get up that high anymore because there's that sense there of, it's okay, you know, having that sense of aversion present doesn't mean that I can't operate, you know. It just, and, and then taking out the information from that, you know, there's a sense of something is, is kind of not according to my ideas, you know, then we have to investigate if there's something we need to do here or is there something we need to just simply let go and then we can make an informed decision. And that's that's a, exactly, you know, what the Buddhist teaching is all about. It, it helps us to know, you know, what can we, what's the right way to respond. And, uh, and then, you know, more and more the experience itself becomes more and more secondary and the way how we relate to it becomes more and more important you know and that's where you know where the training lies and then uh, you know we are more and more interested in in the structure of our experience and not so much anymore identified with the content you know, and, and the structure, what, what becomes apparent more and more through practice is, yes, you know, all of those experiences on whichever level they are, body, feeling, mood of the mind, or, you know, principles of how the mind works, they all are impermanent. And they all are, you know, not satisfactory. So then, you know, if we, whatever, if we get what we want or if we don't get what we want, it's both impermanent. And then it dawns, you know, it dawns on the mind slowly but surely if we pay attention to that. 
and not being so hooked on the wanting and not wanting, there's a sense of freedom in that, you know. And then we can still enjoy, you know, if we get what we want, of course, by all means, enjoy it. But enjoying it in a different way, you know, not in the desperate way. Wow, well, you know, I hope I get it again and I don't want it to stop and all of those things. There's much more capacity to really enjoy because we know, you know, one thing comes and the next thing goes. And, you know, I remember when, when Ayanana Bodhi and I came to America 2008 and when President Obama, you know, we were like, yay, so happy. You know, everything is going to change now and we're just going to go like, Shh, you know, and then, uh, and now, ah, and, I, and it's going to be like that always. And if you have lived long enough, and I have now long lived, I'm 62. I'm getting the hang of it now, you know. <laughs> Finally, after so long, it's just always going to be that way. And there's nothing wrong with it, you know. It's just, this is samsara, you know. And samsara means to roll on and on and on. And it's compared with a wheel, you know. Yeah, and you know, and anyone who still has greed, hatred, and delusion in the mainstream is gonna take rebirth in something like this, you know? And then being really, you know, nudged along to, to keep on learning because we can't really get out of it in the sense of running away from it because there's nowhere to go. You know, there's walls here and there, wherever coming up limitations, you know, but what we can do is we can slowly but surely get a bigger perspective on all of this and, and start to see it's not about getting what you want and, and running away from what you don't want. That's not the point. It's, it's, there's something completely different happening. And, and what is happening is, you know, to expand the mind and to put down wrong ideas. So, Kathy, I'm kind of confused now. Are we already at the end of, of, the, of the session? Technically, yes. What what did I do? I wasn't very <laughs> nice for <what> I think. <laughs> well, you know, this is what happens when you meditate on infinite space. Sometimes <laughs> the space becomes infinite. Um, one thing we could do is um, we could allow yeah. people who had kind of planned on this being the end to leave if they want. And if you have maybe 20 more minutes, we could do a short kind of encore Q&A. Yes, um, let's okay. Sorry. Cool. So I'll just... a good example of not being back. I just want to say this is a good example of you know not being really getting carried away a little bit. <laughs> I just did the meditation too long. Sorry. <laughs> Please don't apologize for having us meditate with you. <laughs> it was a <laughs> privilege and a pleasure. I, I will say for if anyone did have um kind of a tight kind time container, let me just say a few words now about um, Loka Bihara and the Dharma Collective, and then anyone who wants to stay on for Q&A can stay in the room. Um, but I know some of you are here for the first time. I'm about to drop like 17 links in the chat all at once, so don't get overwhelmed, but there they all are. Um, oh. The first one that you're seeing is uh, the Loka Bihara website. You can go there if you want to learn more about Loka Bihara. Um, the next little block has some links um, if you would like to practice Dana for the San Francisco Dharma Collective. So when you uh, practice Dana for the collective, we pass on 70% um, of your donation to the teachers and we keep 30% to sustain the Sangha. Um, and importantly, the Dharma Collective is founded and persists on the principle that the Dharma should be accessible to everybody, regardless of financial situation. So if you can't donate, 
uh, don't and just keep coming. Uh, and if you want to keep in touch with us, there's two links there. One is for the newsletter, so you can know what else is happening at the collective. We do all sorts of different things. So we're student-led, um, lineage independent meditation center. We have silent morning sits. We have a sutra study group. Um, we have teachers every night of the week teaching from different lineages and different traditions. Uh, so keep in touch and uh, subscribe to the YouTube channel. This video will go up uh, within a couple of days, hopefully. It all depends when the video editing team, uh, which is me, uh, gets it up there. <laughs> Hopefully very soon uh, and um, and we upload a lot of the other sits on there too so if there's you know I know uh, someone's calling in from Florida I'm in Vermont uh, and so I can't always go to a sit if it's at you know 10 p.m. my time but I can keep up on the on the YouTube channel uh, and with that I'll say uh, thank you all for your practice I think I can speak for the whole group when I say thank you so much uh, Aya Santa Chita for sharing your presence with us we're so glad uh, that you're here and then if anyone wants to stay, what I'll do is I'll stop the recording and then we can do a little Q&A. Thank you. Thanks.